What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the show. Whether you're joining us from YouTube and you're looking at my ugly mug, or you're listening to the podcast, humble welcome back to the HQ. It's your man's Nicholas. Big dogs gotta eat BDGE fantasy football as always. It's Monday, so it's in the muck Monday. We're comparing two players for 2018 fantasy football that you'll likely have to choose between in your draft. We've done Jamal Williams versus Aaron Jones. We did Royce Freeman versus Ronald Jones. We did Stefan Diggs versus Josh Gordon. Those have been the previous three weeks. So if you've missed any of those, go check them out. They were pretty good, got some good feedback, and a lot of people are liking these videos. So I'm definitely gonna continue them throughout the summer. Today, we're looking at two NFC South running backs. Christian McCatchfree. I feel like, has that been used yet? Christian McCatchfree? I feel like that should be his nickname. And Devonta Freeman. So we got a couple rivals, a couple young, spry whippersnappers ready to handle the rock for their respective teams in Carolina and Atlanta. Before we get into the video, I am giving away one pro football focus edge package to one of you guys, one of my subscribers. I'm going to buy you a year subscription to this. This is an awesome package. This is one of, this might be the only one I actually pay for throughout the season. Pro football edge package has a ton of awesome things involved in it. It has the stat sheet, which you can filter by year and by position and things like that. You could look at individual player grades that so many people harp on when it comes to PFF, wide receiver, cornerback matchups throughout the season, linebacker, tight end matchups. There's, there's so many different cool little things that come with the PFF package. So I'm going to give it away to one of you guys. What you have to do is three things. Sorry, I'm going to be annoying and spammy here. You just got to follow me on social medias. So on Twitter, it's Nick underscore BDGE. On Instagram, BDGE underscore fantasy football. So go follow me on the two socials and then leave your boy a podcast rating and review. You don't even have to really listen to it. I don't care. Just go leave a five-star rating and review. It is BDGE fantasy football. That's what it'll be in the app store. Go do those three things. Twitter, Instagram, podcast. If you do those three things, you will be entered. And like Pusha T said, let's start putting numbers on the board. We're going to kick it off with Devonta Freeman. Um, and before we start, Devonta Freeman is currently running back 13. Overall 22, Christian McCaffrey's actually overall 21, running back 12. So McCaffrey's going one spot, one ranking higher, according to Fantasy Football Calculator ADP. So again, I don't just make this shit up when I talk about it in the Muck Monday. These are real problems that are going to come up in your fantasy football draft. So we're going to start off with Devonta Freeman, right? After zominating the fantasy football running back landscape 2015, 2016, a crazy stretch of sex, so, ooh, success, that's a good foreshadowing for my Saturday night. It is Saturday right now, I'm filming this to get it out for Monday. He came back down to earth in 2017, finishing at a terrible running back 13 um, for fantasy. When you look at it, he was actually running back 11 in points per game. And if you discount the one game in which he left against Dallas after two carries, he got hurt, then he's a top 10 running back in points per game. So not a bad year overall, despite the heavy, heavy expectations. Most people took him in the first round last year. So that's why they were, dis they were disappointed. Um, so I had to figure out what was going on here with Freeman. As, as always, you know, your man's had to dive deep and figure out you know, what the story was. What was the storyline? What was the thesis behind Freeman? What can we expect going into 2018? Freeman, I want to look historically how good Freeman has been. Since he took over as a starter in Atlanta in 2015, he has played in 50 games, and that includes five playoff games. So 45 reg, 45 reg season, five playoff games. Devonta Freeman, actually, before I say this, go down, leave a comment below. Before I say it, how many touchdowns has he scored in his 50 career games as the starter in Atlanta? If you get it right prior to me saying it, I'll know. I'll know who y'all are lying. Go leave a comment down below how many he scored in his 50 career games. You'll get an extra entry into the PFF raffle. I'll give you two seconds. While you're down there, hit the thumbs up button. Go comment. He has scored 40 touchdowns in those 50 career games. That is an 80% rate of games that he scored a touchdown in. We're looking at a guy that is like historical rate. Nobody scores touchdowns at that rate over that period of time 50 games right Zeke has done that I think he scored 25 and 25 but he's got to continue that pace basically over the next double amount of games that he's done in his career 
Now, when I'm looking back at the storyline of 2017, here's what we see. The Falcons started off very hot, right? A three and one record to kick things off. Looking pretty good. Freeman scored four times in those first four games. Great. Touching the ball nearly 20 times per game. Boom. You're happy. Freeman's your workhorse back. You picked them first round and you're ecstatic about what he's doing thus far. Hasn't let you down. Then something happened, right? Their week five bye happened. Um, after their week five bye or in inside the bye, they decided for whatever reason to tweak their offense. Just a fun fact here, prior to 2017, the Falcons last eight games coming off their bye week, so the last eight seasons, they were seven and one coming off their bye week. Very, 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 very good. Then they played the fucking Dolphins last year at home and they lost an unbelievable game 20 to 17. This game, this gets me like frustrated just talking about this. This is an, a super embarrassing, this is probably the most embarrassing loss in the NFL up to that point in the season. Probably might have been all season to be honest with you. I remember this because I might have been betting on that game. They might have been like two touchdown favorites and I might have lost a lot of money on it. I'm not saying that happened, but I'm saying it might have happened. Uh, regardless, something changed after that bye week. And it had to do with Julio. It had to do with this offense. Over the first four weeks of the season, a month of the season, right? A month of the, of the football season, Julio saw two red zone targets and one 10 zone target. So one target inside the 10 yard line. That was their game plan and it was working, right? Not really feeding Julio the ball down there. And they got a lot of scrutiny the year prior to that. Why are they not feeding Julio the ball more? Blah, blah, blah. Why do you need to change the game plan when you're fucking 25 points away from winning the Super Bowl? Like, why do you need to all of a sudden switch things up? Why is everyone yelling about Julio when we're already in the Super Bowl about to win? I get it, 28-3. If you leave a fucking comment down below about 28-3, you're, you're getting negative entries into the raffle. I'm probably blocking you. I'm not going to block you, but you, you, you're not winning the PFF raffle if you comment 28-3 down below. I'll tell you that shit. So, they have their bye, and Sarkeesian says... No mas. We're going to, you know what, we don't, I don't like winning, so we're going to just start forcing Julio the ball, and that's it. And you've probably heard this stat already this summer if you're into fantasy football this early, but Julio ended up with 19, after, after the first month of the season having two red zone targets, he finished the season with 19 red zone targets and 11 10 zone targets. Only six wide receivers in the NFL, in the NFL saw more red zone targets than Julio on the year, despite Julio registering, registering a 26% catch rate on those red zone targets. And only two wide receivers in the NFL had more 10 zone targets than Julio. And listen to this. There were 51 players in the NFL last year that saw 12 red zone targets or more. 51, 12 red zone targets or more. Julio's 26.3% catch percentage was 50th among 50 players. Only Mike Wallace had a lower catch percentage. So for his raw ability and just how athletic and how good of a receiver he is, I think we just need to come to terms with the fact that Julio is not the monster red zone target that we want him to be. Anyways, back to Freeman, right? After their after their bye in week five, starting in week six, Freeman went on a six-game touchdown list streak from week six all the way through week 13. And guys, that, that stretch of six games not scoring a touchdown is factored into his 80% touchdown rate of scoring in games. That's insane. So a guy who has an 80% touchdown rate of scoring had a six game streak last year. When you have such a small sample size, that would skew it heavily. Still ended up with an 80% touchdown rate, right? Had he not had those six games of scoreless streaks, take those out, you're looking at a 91% touchdown rate. What happened? Well, like I said, they started forcing Julio the ball, among other things. After Freeman saw 20 touches a game from weeks one to four, he averaged just 11 and a half touches a game during this six game touchdown list streak. And guess what happened to the Falcons? They went two and four during that span. Okay, so week 14 hits and, and the game plan changes again. Instead of giving him 11 and a half touches per game, they decide to start feeding Freeman again for the remainder of the season. Week 14, he gets 24 carries. They get a huge in-division win over the Saints. Over those last four weeks, from weeks 14 to week 17, Freeman averages 21 touches a game. He scores in three of four games, and the team goes 3-1, and one, getting them into the playoffs. And I want to add this in. Uh, per Evan Silva of Roto World in his Falcons team preview column, which I'll link in the show notes down below in the description. Quote unquote, suffering a preseason concussion, 
missing weeks 11 and 12 with another concussion, and wearing down while playing through MCL and PCL sprains. Freeman's stretch run efficiency plummeted, averaging 2.64 yards per carry in Atlanta's final four games. Freeman avoided surgery, but admitted in May he wasn't yet 100%. Still indications are Freeman will regain full strength well before training camp to return as the job secure lead back in an offense primed for positive TD regression. So this down season came in a year when Freeman was clearly not at full health, right? Preseason concussions, MCL and PCL sprains down the stretch. You know, this has to be factored into it because he was, it's not like he's injury prone, right? He played in 31 of 32 games prior to the 2017 season. Now, as you can see, when Freeman touches the ball, good things happen for the Falcons. In 2017, Freeman had six games in which he touched the ball 16 plus times, six games. The Falcons went five and one. 2016, there were 10 games that he saw 16 touches or more. The Falcons went 8-2 and two in that span. They need to keep feeding Freeman the ball. For those of you concerned about the Tevin Coleman versus Devonta Freeman split, do we think Tevin Coleman gets more work? Blah, blah, blah. Is this a huge factor? Looking at this chart, you could see Freeman's touches per game have, have gone down each of the last three seasons. But it's not because of Tevin Coleman. If you look at it, right... We can, uh, oh, okay, so by the way, those touches per games are, are so flip 15 and 17. Touches per game in 2015 should be the top row, the 21.09 and 6.45 for Tevin Coleman. That was 2015, the year Devonta Freeman absolutely dominated and finished as RB1 in fantasy. But the last two years have been pretty consistent in terms of touches and in terms of what Tevin Coleman has seen, right? And I don't, I don't expect their game, their game plan to change much um, going off the last two years. There's no reason why Tevin Coleman should see a, a super increase in in touches. And if you actually look at the touch ratio from 2016 to 2017, which is all the way in the right, which means like basically the split of touches in terms of percentages, it actually went up in favor of Freeman in uh, in 2017. So it, it wasn't even like we're seeing a trend where in 2016, you know, it got closer and then 2017, it got even closer. And then you expect it to be even closer and closer in 2018. It actually got bigger in terms of Freeman's gap for 2017. So I'm not worried about that at all. And you look at the snap counts. Um, it also went up for Freeman in 2017. So I still see him as the clear cut lead back to a Coleman who is just um, an extremely, extremely luxury role player for the Falcons that they can use at their despair, but will never take over that workhorse role unless Freeman gets hurt. Um, so that's kind of, you know, that's how I see it in terms of the splits if you're worried about that. And the last thing we need to talk about is the offense overall, who despite taking a step back or seemingly taking a step back in 2017, they were actually really, really, really good last year. They ranked, let me get these for you, second in the NFL in yards per drive, third in yards per play, second in plays per drive, and first in time of possession per drive. So they were very good on offense efficiently. However, they ranked 15th in the NFL in points per game, 22.1 points per game, 15th in the NFL. So they just could not finish, man. They got whiskey dick last year. They couldn't get it going. And when you look at like how good they were on a per play basis, right? They moved the ball with ease and dominated within the 20s. They just couldn't finish. Um, and when you see them ranking first overall in time of possession, that's going to work against you because you're you're sucking up clock and you're putting together good drives, but you cannot finish. And their, um, you know, Matt Ryan's touchdown percentage hit a career low or a very low mark. I don't think it was a career low, but it was probably the second lowest of his career. 3.8% of his throws went for touchdowns last year. His career average is 4.6%. So the uh, amount of touch, uh, amount of his total passes that went for touchdowns, his career average is 4.6%. His MVP season in 2016 was 7.1%. So you did expect regression in, in uh, 2017, but now you expect positive regression going into 2018 because that 3.8% mark was well below his actual career average. So I'm expecting him to bounce back, which means I'm expecting them to close more drives. I'm expecting them to be better near the red zone for sure, because this is one of the more telling rates of uh, what you can expect from quarterbacks the next season. we've There's been studies and blog posts and articles done about touchdown percentage when it comes to quarterbacks. So this is a telling factor in whether or not a quarterback is going to bounce back. And I believe Matt Ryan will be that guy in 2018 who's a really, really good late round pick for you. So if we saw that 3.8% jump up to his average of 4.6%, his passing touchdowns 
go up by over four passing touchdowns on the year. And not to mention 2017 was his lowest pass attempt total since 2009. So if we assume a pass attempt increase, right, even if it's not crazy, just a little bit of a pass attempt increase because that was the lowest total since 2009, plus a touchdown percentage spike just back to average. Now, it doesn't have to be above average, just back to his career average, not getting crazy. Ryan should realistically get back to that 27 to 28 passing touchdown total um, that we could expect. And that's been his seasonal average since 2010. He's averaged 28 passing touchdowns a season since 2010. So that's big for this offense, and especially a guy like Freeman, who I know I'm talking about passing attempts, but Freeman's heavily, heavily involved in the passing game, obviously. Look back a couple years ago, he had, I don't know, he had like 60 receptions, 65 receptions, then 55, and that number kind of fell off last year, and I think it had to do with the offense, and it had to do with Matt Ryan overall. But don't get fooled. This offense was very good. They just could not close drive. So don't don't be down on them this year. Um, and, you know, he's the main beneficiary when it comes to goal line carries. He is out-carried. Tevin Coleman um, in on the goal line by a huge number over the last few years, and he's still that main goal line back there. So if this offense improves and this offense bounces back, that's only going to help Freeman more. So I love Freeman to have a monster bounce back in 2018, but Christian McCaffrey is also very, 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 very good. So we're going to have to break him down. But before we do, I want to tell you about a couple things. The live draft weekend that I'm doing in August still has one spot open. By the time you watch this video, it might be completely closed out, to be honest with you. Um, but we do have one spot open. It's a live draft we're doing. I'm taking nine subscribers to New York City. If you've never been, this is going to be an awesome experience for your first time. I rented out an incredible Airbnb. It is a penthouse suite in Hell's Kitchen, right in the heart of Manhattan. We're going to do a live draft, but we're going to kick it from Friday to Sunday. We're going to hang out. We're going to go out. We're going to party. We're going to talk bullshit, hang out, talk football, talk life, liberty, love, pursuit of happiness. It's going to be an awesome weekend. So we do have one spot. If you are interested in getting into this league, it's a fantasy football league, of course, shoot me an email, nick at bigdogsfantasy.com. Only serious inquiries. This is going to be an expensive weekend, so you're going to have to pay a high ticket price. This is not a free ride. I'm not hooking you guys up. You're hooking yourself up, but I promise you, you're going to get incredible value on, uh, on the weekend. So if you are interested, make sure you hit me up ASAP because there's one slot left in the league. And secondly, we want to say thank you to our sponsors today, FantasyJocks.com. FantasyJocks.com. They are the industry leader. They actually won an award, number one rated by FSTA, the Fantasy Sports Trade Association, which is the official fantasy sports association of fantasy sports. Damn, how many times can I repeat myself? I mean, it needs to be repeated that these guys are good. Number one award winning. They have rings. They have belts. See that? 24 karat gold, baby. Bruno Mars would be proud. They have trophies like Lombardi trophies. Legit, you can get the champion's name etched onto the side of your belt, your trophy. They have live draft board kits, which we will be using for our draft in New York City in August. Uh, just really, really awesome. The number one industry leader in anything you need for your fantasy sports league. These things are legit. Have everyone in your league chip in an extra five, eight bucks on top of the buy-in, and then you guys got something serious, baby. I'm telling you, it's way more fun when you actually play for something on the line. Even if it's a novelty item like this, man, you guys, it, it just, it gives you more incentive to talk shit. You wear that thing out when you're with your friends. If you're watching football on Sunday, the, pre, the, the following year, I would be wearing that shit all the time. Fortunately, I actually have to give that to the champion of my league um, at some point, which I think is gonna be probably tomorrow. So I can't really plug that into my videos anymore, but make sure you get that, fantasyjocks.com. They will be linked low but let's get back to c mac christian mccatch free like i said overall 21 running back 12 last year he was the eighth overall pick by carolina in the nfl draft c mac did not disappoint in his rookie year leading all nfl running backs in targets with i think it was like 103 and he finished third in receptions among the position with 80 catches which would have tied for first in both 2016 and 2015, F-dub, I-dub, for what it is worth. C-Mac was involved enough in the passing game that he finished as RB15 in standard leagues, RB13 in half PPR, and RB9 in PPR. So a rookie season, top 10 in full PPR. Very impressive. Imagine he actually performed on the ground last year, man. He could have had something crazy going on there in Carolina. Sheesh! Along with his 80-651-5 stat line through the air, 
He ran the ball 117 times for 435 yards and two scores. Overall, great rookie year. Um, finished with just under 1,100 total yards and seven scores, despite getting less than 200 touches. That is efficiency, right? It's like a poor man's Alvin Kamara, kind of, but that is still a compliment because Alvin Kamara is basically the... It's basically like the people who are fake poor. That's it. You know the people, the homeless people in New York make like... They've done studies on it. They make a shitload of money. If you're in a good location, some of them bring home like hundreds of dollars a day. Uh, anyways, yeah, C-Mac is basically the equivalent of a homeless person in New York City. So he's a poor man's Kamara, but he's still making dough. When you look at 2018, I think the efficiency and the volume in the run game are what are going to make and break C-Mac heading into year two. Um, I, I think C-Max floor is very high. I think people are going to be drafting very high, though, this year. Um, and they're probably banking on a breakout. After a really strong rookie year, I mean, you would expect another step forward. Uh, but we need to dive in a little more to see what, if we can actually expect that, right? Obviously, that 117 carries hurts a bit. You'd love to see more volume there, especially when he couldn't find a way to beat out Jonathan Stewart, who's like 48 years old, and he averaged a career low, I think, like 3.4 yards per carry. But C-Mac was just, he was not good on the ground. Um, Stewart, in turn, got over almost 200 touches, right? Right under 200, right under 200 carries and like eight catches or something like that. C-Mac himself was not good, right? 3.7 yards per carry on his rookie year. Um, and of course, yards per carry is not a good metric to just look at by itself in a vacuum and say like whether or not someone is good. Uh, but when you take a little deeper dive into the efficiency metrics, he wasn't very good as a running back. His tackles evaded per attempt per PFF, which can also be found in the PFF package. I'm going to buy one of y'all. Don't forget to enter. Ranked 36th amongst qualified running back. His yak, yard after contact, was 62nd. His yards created per carry, per playerprofiler.com, ranked 52nd. He was 34th among 47 qualified backs, according to Football Outsiders, for their DYAR rank, which is pretty much their version of an efficiency metric for running backs. So it wasn't just like one subjective view. There was all of these main websites telling you that Christian McCaffrey was not good as a running back last year. He saw double-digit carries just three times in 2017. He averaged 2.7 yards per carry in, or 2.7 yards per carry or worse in nine of 17 games, including their playoff game uh, at New Orleans. The question then becomes, what is C-Mac's usage in the run game going to look like in 2018? They let go of Jonathan Stewart, but they bring in CJ Anderson, who is pretty much at this point a younger version of Jay Stewart. So he's going to be a little bit more explosive. He's going to be able to do more things, right? They were both well-rounded backs who can contribute on all three downs. Um, so they're similar in the sense, but CJ Anderson is a few years younger. And, um, you know, I, I think C.J. Anderson basically slips right into that role. I think if you actually thought C-Mac was going to be the three-down workhorse back in Carolina, then you were pretty naive. There was no doubt in my mind that they were going to bring in another running back. I just didn't know if it was going to be DeMarco or C.J. or who it was actually going to be. Anderson is coming off his first 1,000-yard rushing season. He went four over 1,000. He hit that four-digit mark in Denver last year. Um, and he should be more efficient than Stewart was. Like I said, Stewart hit a career low, 3.4 yards per carry, so there's nowhere to go but up for C.J. Anderson. Something that does concern me, though, for all the running backs, just the running game in general, is the offensive line, who ranked last year 24th per um, football outsiders in run blocking and a mediocre 15th per fo pro football focus in terms of yards before contact for running backs. Now they lost their all-pro left guard, Andrew Norwell, to Jacksonville via free agency, so that's definitely not a plus for their running backs. However... More volume should offset, um, you know, the line issues if McCaffrey can increase those carry totals. Now, reports out of camp, and you can take these as you want to, is that McCaffrey's telling reporters he's added about five pounds of muscle to his 200, 205 pound frame. So he's gotten a little bigger, which should help in the run game, should help his yak and his in-between the tackles carries. Uh, Roto World did say McCaffrey looked noticeably bigger or noticeably different in pictures. So maybe there is some truth to the added weight because, you know, a lot of people always say they're in the best shape of their life, blah, blah, blah. Um, so maybe pictures would clarify that it's true. Ron Rivera, their coach, obviously, also backed this up saying that he definitely believes McCaffrey can handle a bigger workload going back to his college days. He was a true workhorse running both inside and outside of the tackles at a very high volume, which is true. Um, but that doesn't always translate to the NFL because he's so elusive and so explosive that sometimes, you know, the NFL defenders uh, close the gap between how talented you are in college and then the NFL. So 
that could definitely be an issue here. Now, I do think that the, the volume in rushing attempts will go up a bit under uh, the new offensive coordinator, Norv Turner, but I'm also afraid that the targets might dip a little bit. Now, we're looking back, right? Norv Turner, he didn't coach in 2017, but we can look back to 2016, where he was the offensive coordinator in Minnesota. The team targeted their running backs on 21% of their passes, which was the NFL average um, that year. And, you know, it's uh, it, might, it might mean nothing, that number, right? It might mean shit considering, like, you, you're going to change your offense and tweak your offense depending on what weapons you have in the offense, and they might run way more plays that are catered towards Cam rushing and, and throwing the ball to C-Mac, but it's noticeable nonetheless that maybe North Turner offenses don't throw that much, but it also cannot be discounted that Tor uh, Turner, you know, as much as he's been a beneficiary of many legendary backs, people kind of anoint him the running back whisperer because he's worked with guys like Emmett Smith. Uh, Ladanian Tomlinson, Frank Gore, Adrian Peterson throughout his tenure in the NFL. A lot of impressive backs there. So you'd like to think that he can turn some switch on for C-Mac or, you know, just make him produce at a much higher efficiency level than he did in his rookie campaign. Um, and this offense will probably utilize a little more run pass option than they did in 2017, which is going to be good for C-Mac, I think. The thing that scares me, though, is they're getting Greg Olson back, of course, who missed a lot of time last year, right? He only played in, I think, was it seven games? And I look back at Christian McCaffrey's numbers last year in games with versus without Olsen, and it is not good for McCaffrey's receiving outlook. On the left are games in which Greg Olsen played. On the right are games in which he did not play. You see that C-Max saw nearly two and a half more targets, and he caught two more passes per game without Olsen in the lineup. He also had three more carries in the game with Greg Olsen, so he they ran the ball more with C-Mac when Olsen was in the lineup, and he caught less passes, which is um, which makes sense, of course. So, you know, with Greg Olsen back in the lineup, it might make sense that C-Mac sees less volume in the passing game. If his, if his passing game volume dips, that's going to be a pretty big impact on his bottom line in fantasy. The other thing you have to work, like, worry about is the other weapons they brought in, I think. Right? They use their first round pick on DJ Moore. They bring in Torrey Smith via trade from the Eagles. They bring in Jarius Wright. They get Curtis Samuel back, who was their first first round pick last year in the NFL draft. So, you know, these effects might, you know, I'm not saying that this is going to be a huge impact, but if anything, they're definitely not positives for C Max target total, right? His target volume in going into 2018. So I look at that as another kind of not exactly a red flag, but something pushing down his ceiling a little bit. So that's the other thing. And, you know, that, that's kind of my outlook on C-Mac. I do see C.J. Anderson, like I said, fitting right into that Jonathan Stewart role. Maybe he doesn't see 200 carries, but I still think he'll hit maybe 175. Maybe C-Mac goes up from 115 to, to 130 or 140 carries. Not going to be a huge difference, especially if he's hovering around 3.7 to 4 yards a carry. That's only going to equate to maybe an extra 100 rushing yards, if that, on the season. Jonathan Stewart saw a ton of goal line carries, which I think C.J. Anderson will likely see as as he's a much bigger back than C-Mac. It's a very valuable position. You still have Cam Newton there, obviously, so he's taking away some of the rushing opportunity on the goal line, which McCaffrey really didn't get at all last year. Um, I think he had like two carries inside the five-yard line. He was heavily targeted in the red zone um, in the passing game, which is obviously good. But I still think there's there's a few more red flags about C-Mac than I would prefer at this at this spot, especially compared to Freeman. So conclusion: when all is said is when all is said when all is said, it's already been said and done. I think C-Mac is going to see a somewhat similar bottom line or somewhat similar finish to what we saw in 2018 as we did in 2017. A lot of receptions, a lot of playmaking. A lot of flashy plays. Although they're saying all the right things about McCaffrey in terms of wanting to give him more work, I think them bringing in C.J. Anderson speaks louder to me than their words, right? A lot of fake news is coming out, a lot of noise. Um, Anderson should serve as Jay Stu did last year, seeing a hefty portion of that early down work and a lot of the goal line work. Um, yeah, so I do have the numbers. Stewart outcarried McCaffrey 12-2 to on the goal line in 2017. However, Anderson is only on a one-year deal worth under $2 million, so it's not really a big shot to the to the uh, Panthers team if they you know cut their losses and it doesn't work out with Anderson and they decide to just make McCaffrey that guy. I don't think it's going to happen, but just throwing that in there for what it's worth. Uh, then I look at Freeman and I look at this offense, and I think if he's healthy for a full season, guys, if he plays a full 16 games, I think it's nearly impossible for him to finish with under 1,200, probably 1,300 total yards between receptions and rushing. 
and an absolute minimum nine touchdowns, probably double digit touchdowns. He did it easily 2015. He hit both those marks easily in 2016. He was on pace to do it in 2017 had he not gotten hurt for two weeks and missed two games. I think that's I think that's really like a, an actual reasonable projection for Freeman. So 1,300 total yards, probably double digit scores if he plays the full 16. So realistically, the point I'm trying to get to is what I think a reasonable projection for Devonta Freeman is, I think is the absolute ceiling for C-Mac. I really can't see him hitting 1,300 total yards and double digit touchdowns. If you do, I still think that Freeman has a much, much more likely chance to hit those numbers. Uh, so it's an easy choice for me, for me when it comes to Devonta Freeman here um, over Christian McCaffrey, despite McCaffrey going prior to Devonta Freeman, which was surprising to me. Um, you know, the additions to the weapons in Carolina, as well as losing Andrew Norwell on the line, just, I don't know, it, it doesn't scream upside for C-Mac for me. Um, in a full PPR league, which of course, where people are going to be targeting C-Mac, I'm still going to be leaning Freeman, um, despite C-Mac's high usage in the passing game, and maybe I'll be in the minority there. Let me know. In a full PPR, are you going to go with C-Mac over Freeman? Um, C-Mac finished above Freeman in overall PPR scoring last year, but they were both exactly at 14.4 PPR fantasy points per game. And that is counting, again, Devonta Freeman's game against Dallas where he exited after two carries. Realistically, Freeman actually was the better PPR play last year. That's going to wrap it up for today. Guys, if you got a lot of value out of this, please give this a thumbs up video. Also leave a comment because that helps YouTube's algorithm and more people can see this and find this and I can grow and I'll get more motivated to put out more videos, yada, yada, yada. So give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We'll be bringing videos like this all summer. Go follow me on social media, especially if you're trying to enter into the PFF Edge Package giveaway. Um, I will announce that probably first week of July. So you got you got a little bit of time to do so, but go follow me on all the socials. You can pre-order my draft guide. Uh, I forgot to plug it into the video, Zam, but pre-order my draft guide. We're covering everything, getting you ready. It's a one-stop shop for anything your fantasy football draft needs. You don't need to look anywhere else. I will hook you up. I'll help you win your league via the draft. My draft guide, which is on sale now, only one week left to get it at pre-order pricing. July 1st, the price goes up. So snag it on my website. It will be linked down below. And I'll see y'all on Wednesday. Love y'all. I wonder what went wrong today. Why do I feel like I linger?